Welcome to part 9 of the Nintendo Power Retrospectives. I'm Count Zero. This time we're taking a look at part 3 of Nintendo Power for November and December of 1988. We've got a lot of ground to cover, so let's get started. Our cover game is Track and Field 2 from Konami. The cover here is semi-abstract. Rather than having someone doing track and field events in the cover, we instead have a pair of unoccupied sneakers with rocket boosters running on a track that is being suspended in the void while spectral figures do track and field events in the background. I get the impression the artists doing these covers are still trying to get their footing on how to depict the games they're covering. Appropriately enough, our cover game is the first game getting an article on this issue. Um, the track and field article gives a rundown of the game's three play gameplay modes. Training mode, where you try out all the events. Olympic mode, which is the game's career mode and Versus Mode, which has a brief selection of events that involve simultaneous head-to-head -head competition. The article also has a rundown of most of the events you can play in the game, including their controls. Um, basically, every event of this game is covered here, except for arm wrestling, which is a two-player only event. Track and Field 2 is kind of a weird game to review. Games like this tend to be better off as games to play with a friend in a high-score competition than as a single-player career mode kind of thing. Um, I'm really not that good at this game, but to a certain degree, I think that's kind of the point. I mean, this is the sequel to an arcade game designed to eat your quarters, though this version is specifically meant for home console systems, but it makes no changes to the gameplay or alterations from the original, aside from shuffling the events, ar events around. Um, and in particular, some events, it's difficult to figure out what strategies you need to employ to succeed in them, though others are a little more straightforward with a little practice. Honestly, I didn't enjoy this game, but to a certain degree, it might be because I'm playing this game alone. Theoretically, if I was playing this with someone else, I'd probably enjoy it more, but I'm not in a position to play the game that way, and so I can't count that, account that in my review, so I kind of got to give this a thumbs down. Next is Mickey Mousecapade. This article has less of a description of how you play the game, and more of stuff like level maps for the first couple stages in the game. Oh, this game is awful. My god, this game is bad. So, in the game, you play as Mickey and Minnie, and you go through the various stages, trying to find your way through the exit. While all of the way, facing a barrage of various types of enemies. There are cats and scorpions who can shoot bullets at you. There are birds which try to poop on you with poop that kills you, or at least harms you. You have the semi-race racist Chinese mushrooms from Fantasia which try to attack you, and through all of this you're navigating the game's multiple maze stages, trying to figure out the pattern of enemy attacks, and enduring the game's terrible jumping controls. And it isn't helped by the fact that while this is a game shipped in 1988 in the United States, I can tell from how you play this game that this is a 1987 first generation title. How do I know this? Well. This game uses a very stupid trick and used by lots of first generation NES titles, particularly ones that air towards the Kusoge side of things, to pad out their levels by requiring you to basically find secrets through randomly shooting stuff in the environment, not by getting hints from characters or exploring by going to new areas, but instead just shooting everything with whatever bullets your character has and hoping something is revealed. Um, it's usually secret doors, secret keys, and many of these targets being things in the game that you could very easily miss. And not just in terms of, like, overlooking it, but in terms of shoot at it and miss the section of the target that is the hitbox. Further, sometimes some of these hidden items can be harmful as well. As in the first stage, if you are separated from Minnie um, by a monster grabbing her because you shot a door that you shouldn't have, you can't complete the stage until you find her, and if necessary, rescue her, leading to a situation where you're required to hunt through the stage again, shooting random stuff until you find a room where Minnie is hidden, where in term of those characters that, you, that are there, it's like she's been transformed into a generic sprite, and if you pick the wrong one, then you have to go find her again. But wait, you say, didn't I forgive Castlevania 2 for its puzzles that were impossible to solve without a guide? That is true, but... Those puzzles were impossible to solve for a different reason. The game contained clues. In, directly in the Japanese version, they had false clues, but they had helpful clues 
there were kind of little things in there that help you tell which was which, particularly based on, like, I guess kanji for laughter, laughter, that sort of thing. I forget off the top of my head. But the point is, there was a way where you could get accurate clues that would help you. Whereas here, there's nothing. It is sheer just... It is essentially pixel bitching. You shoot everything, you hope to hit the right pixel, and you hope it's something that doesn't harm you instead. Um... And what makes this worse is that this game is basically put out by two companies which should know better. Hudson and Capcom. Both companies have done superior works in terms of platformers, and both of which would, uh, would do better by the Disney franchise, particularly Capcom. Oh, so there's no good reason to play this game. You should really just avoid it at almost all costs. This issue, in Howard and Nestor, we have our first two-page strip. A couple of Nestor's friends are looking for advice on how to reach Bodley Manson in Castlevania II. Nestor gets stuck and has to be reminded by Howard to use the Red Crystal at Yuba Lake in order to get transported to the mansion. This issue has a more in-depth article covering Blaster Master. However, since I reviewed this game last issue, I think we're good. If you want to hunt this down, the article has some more in-depth maps for the first few areas of the game. Next is our holiday gift guide, which gives us one of those things that modern console gaming has been missing. Platform-specific merchandising. We have a big image gallery of all the products you, products you can get to show off your Nintendo stuff, from sweaters to hats to underoos, which goes to show that how you could probably get more aesthetically pleasing classic Nintendo-themed stuff off of, like, Etsy. And with the game caddies and stuff here, honestly, I found that cheap totes and little bat wicker baskets and stuff from the dollar store will work just as well and will cost you even less. They might even hold more games, too, so nothing here would be really worth hunting down after the fact unless you're a collector of weird old gaming merchandise. Next, as there have been a whole bunch of RPGs hitting the market lately for the Nintendo Entertainment System, we have an article discussing some of the RPGs you can get. First up is Ultima, which is based on Ultima 3 Exodus for the PC. Now, as far as Ultima 3 overall is concerned, I'm just going to refer you to Spoonie's review, as it's much, much better than anything I can do to discuss the game, both in terms of real coverage and discussion of the game, as well as, well, production values. As far as the NES version goes, we get in the article a rundown of the different types of classes, along with some of the monsters in the game's first-person dungeon mode. They also talk a bit about Ambrosia, and how you can go there to boost your abilities at the different shrines, without having to deal with the whole problem of leveling up in the game, and that only boosting your HP and MP, without boosting any of your, any of your other attributes, but in the process also making the enemies on the map more difficult for you to face. Ultima is a bit of a pickle to review, not just because of the fact it's a role-playing game, though that's certainly a part of it, but also because, well, it's support of a highly regarded PC title. Again, for discussion of the PC version, I'm going to refer you here to Spoonie's review of Ultima 3. That said, having played a good bunch of this game before I even started this review series, I even thought about doing this review series for that matter, I have a pretty good grasp of this version of the game's flaws. First, the music will drive you nuts. Absolutely up the freaking wall. Especially the combat music, which is basically a monotonous 10 second loop. I mean, there's slight variation in the notes, but not by much. Second, you can't run from combat. Yes, you can see enemies on the overworld map and try to avoid them, but sometimes they can be fairly hard to avoid, particularly due to how the game handles their pathfinding. After a certain point, the enemies just home in on you to take you out. And once combat happens, it can become particularly glacial in its pace. Particularly once you're waiting for enemies to move in closer to you so you can take them out or get beaten by them for that matter. Third, because this is a console port of an RPG that's designed for computers, there's the whole matter of navigating the menu system. The version for computers was designed for something that had a keyboard on it, and so you could use the keyboard for quicker navigation and item selection. Here, you gotta go through the controller, and wade through menus, and that sort of thing. It's not a total deal-breaker, which is why it's my third thing on the list, but it can become a hassle, and combined with other factors, can make things more obnoxious and more onerous to play. Fourth, 
again because of the console port issue, character names are very short. You've got five characters to work with for the names. Again, not a deal breaker, but in combination with all the other stuff, it can start to get annoying. For, um, and finally, well, I will say this for, in this game's favor, that the sprites in this game have a lot more character to them than the version for the PC. I get the impression that basically when this was ported for the NES by uh, Pony Canyon, basically went, you know, we're porting this to a Japanese audience, we need to give these sprites more character, maybe make them a little more cutesy, and that'll get people more inclined to buy the game. And to, the, to its credit, this does make the characters kind of I was going to say more distinctive. Well, it does make them more distinctive. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say that all the Ultimate games need to have such cutesy character sprites, but it kind of... It, it's it's nice. It's not a... I wouldn't say that it, that it totally sells me on the game, having, you know, cutesy sprites, but I'm not complaining that they're there. Still, honestly, I cannot recommend the console version over the PC version, particularly since the PC version is very easily available through, like, for example, GOG. I'd recommend getting that instead. Next up is an RPG from Nihon Falcom that isn't part of their Ease series, The Legacy of the Wizard. We get a rundown of the different characters you can play and what their strengths and weaknesses are. The Legacy of the Wizard is a game that doesn't quite fit in with this RPG so section. It's loosely connected to Falcom's Dragon Slayer series, which has some role-playing games in it, but I wouldn't exactly call this game an RPG. You play as the members of a family of adventurers, mom, dad, son, and daughter, and the family's pet monster. Each character has different special abilities. For example, here I am playing as Pochi, the dog, who gets ignored by monsters. You then have to, as these characters, collect a group of crowns, one crown per family member, as well as the legendary Dragon Slayer sword, before you finally are able to fight the dragon and try to kill it. This is a game which has a problem similar to the one I had with Mickey Mascapade. It's deliberately obtuse. The game throws this big world at you with areas that you can only access with certain characters, often involving finding hidden blocks. There are no characters in this game that will give you hints, meaning it's up to you to just wander around until you find the place you need to go, or find a map online. This is something that's radically different from, for example, Metroid or even Legend of Zelda, where you can tell that there are areas that you can't go to because you don't have the ability to access those areas yet, but this also means that you know, okay, I can come back to these areas and get to them and access them, because I know that they're there and I need I need something. And usually it's kind of clear what that something is. I need to go here, but I can't jump high enough to get there, so once I find something that helps me jump higher, I can go there. I need to go through here, but... I can't get through there because it's too small a gap. I need something to make me small to let me roll through. I need to get through here, but there's an obstacle I need to blow up. And so I need a bomb to let me blast that area. That sort of thing. Similarly with Castlevania 2, there are hints telling you where you need to go or what you need to do to access certain areas. While these hints were poorly translated for the US release, as I mentioned in my review last episode, the hints are still there. What problem is with Legacy of the Wizard, there's nothing. Um, even for, with Game Center CX, from what I recall, Reno had to rely on a strategy guide in order to beat this game. So, I'm not a big fan of this game, and I'm not recommending picking this up. So, next up is Counselor's Corner. Now, I said this in the Snark titles last time, but it bears repeating. I absolutely adore the little cartoon that they have in the header for Counselor's Corner. It kind of gives it like a little glimpse of what it's like being a game counselor for Nintendo. I doubt it was actually like this, but it's still, it's kind of neat to see. It's a believable work environment, and it's kind of cool seeing that there. Of note here in this issue, we have some questions for Metal Gear. After this, we have classified information, which has, of note, a cheat for Gradius, which basically has the hidden level warps. I didn't even know there were hidden level warts in Gradius. And I played the hell out of that game for years when I was a kid. Um, after this, we have an article about controllers covering the various aftermarket controllers that Nintendo's put out, all of which has gotten certain degrees of notice in the magazine. 
um, specifically the NES Advantage and the NES Max. I own the Advantage, I'm a proud owner of it, and as far as the Max goes, I really have to try it out before I buy it. Um, maybe at the Portland Retro Gaming Expo this coming year, maybe someone will have an NEX Max you can try out before, so you can decide if you really want to get one if it actually gives you, well, an advantage when playing NES games. Anyway, um, after this we have another game article covering anticipation, which is kind of based on the whole uh, Pictionary win-loser-draw concept. Y'all remember win-loser-draw, right? God, I feel old. Anyway, because this is a trivia game, I'm just going to skip this one. On the sports front, we have Blades of Steel from Konami, meeting our two Konami game quota for this issue. We have a rundown of all eight teams in the game, as well as the three gameplay modes, Exhibition, Tournament, and Two-Player, all of which are pretty self-explanatory. Blades of Steel is, almost surprisingly to me, the best hockey game I've ever played. Controls are great and really simple. Passing is a one-button thing. Not button and direction combination, one button. You hit the pass button and it sends the puck to the nearest player on your team in the direction you're facing. Shooting is just as easy and the game even puts a little helpful arrow on the goal to tell you where you're aiming in the goal. The game even puts little mini-games in there for shootouts and fights, which might be first for this genre. Also, during the intermission, it has a little mini-game thing for Gradius, with a whole bunch of ads for other Konami games, which I think is kind of cool. So, I should really expect you. I'll expand on what I said at the start of this, of this little review. This is the best sports game I've played thus far, overall. Over all sports. This game makes me feel like I don't suck at the sport that I'm playing in the game. Which, in my book, makes this game a success. Next up is Cobra Command, which is another shoot-em-up getting coverage of this issue. This game is a helicopter shoot-em-up, sort of like Choplifter, where you go through the level in a 2D side-scrolling perspective, um, horizontal side-scrolling, and you have to rescue hostages and find enemy hidden bases and that sort of thing. The article features a map of the first stage of the game, showing you where all the bases are, that sort of stuff, and I hope this map kind of sets the tone for the later stages of the game, in terms of the style of gameplay. As far as the game itself goes, I call Cobra Command a better choplifter. As the choplifter, as I mentioned in the article description, you make your way through the levels, rescuing hostages as you go. The main twist of the game has from choplifter, though, is there's an upgrade system where, as you go through the game and find enemy bases, you can capture weapon upgrades and vehicle upgrades that make you shoot more bullets or more missiles or make you go faster or make you more efficiently rescue hostages, that sort of thing. Um, these bases also will refill the helicopter's health as well. Another marked difference from Choplifter where there, if you get hit, you're dead. So, unlike Choplifter though, you don't have to take your rescued hostages back to base. Once you collect them, they're rescued, which is another great advantage because there's no backtracking or that sort of thing. This is a fun game. Um, it's a single player only, but it's still. If you liked Choplifter, you'll probably like this even more. So this issue's next game is Racket Attack from Jalico. I don't think we've had a tennis game for a while. Um, we get a rundown of the characters that you play as the game and the controls, as well as the differences between the the different court types in terms of how they play and how they affect the balance of the ball and that sort of thing. I'm really not a fan of this game. When it comes to sports games, as I kind of mentioned under the Blades of Steel review, what helps me decide if I like a game or not is based on a couple of factors. The first is whether or not I feel like I'd really do better at the game in question in video game form than I would in real life. This is kind of what biases me towards football over basketball and baseball, for example. I've played the latter two sports in real life, and I know approximately how well I do. I can know my general performance. And if I'm not doing that well, it kind of frustrates me and makes me think, you know, if I was actually playing this game, I'd be doing better than these characters. It's a similar sort of thing with street hockey, although not ice hockey as well. I don't know how to ice skate. The second factor is, if when I'm playing the game, I have some sort of feedback over what I'm doing wrong to cause me to perform not well, to lose. 
and thus in turn use that to determine what I need to be doing to be doing better. If I can't figure out what I'm doing wrong and how to fix it, I consider that to be a sign of the game providing insufficient feedback, whether it's through poor camera angles, poor controls, or what have you, to tell me what I need to fix. This leads me to my problem with bracket attack. With most modern tennis games, you can generally get a good idea about where the ball is going and where you need to be to hit it. And the game will give you a little wiggle room with your position so you don't do a rookie mistake like chest checking the tennis ball. Similarly, you have a certain amount of control over where you're hitting the ball in terms of straight ahead or to the left or right. In this game, it doesn't have that wiggle room in terms of positioning as in several occasions, my player chest bumped the ball. I've often hit the ball in between the doubles and singles sidelines as well, not by choice, but because I couldn't figure out how to aim the ball so it ended up inside the sidelines. All in all, this leads to an exercise in sort of head scratching frustration, as opposed to controller throwing frustration. Though in any case, frustration is not what I'm looking for in a gaming experience, which means I'm giving this game a skip. Next up is video shorts, and of the games featured this issue, the only real one of note is Tecmo Bowl. Next after that is Packwatch, which features Operation Wolf, as far as being the notable title here, and it is definitely worth mentioning as it's really the first light gun game to come to the home where your character is actually shooting characters that are supposed to be people as opposed to wooden cutouts like with Hogan's Alley. Then we have the, well, bad piece of serialized fiction that basically serves as the precursor to Captain N, the Game Master. This version is titled just Captain Nintendo. We move from here to the NES Journal, which has an article about Woos, a maze-themed amusement park in California. I did a little research on this, and apparently the park ran into problems fairly early on after it opened, and eventually closed its doors and burned down, as from the photographs I found online, the park was almost entirely built out of wood. Currently on the property, there is now a whole bunch of car dealerships. We then have a small sidebar article about the RBI baseball tournament held by Young Junk or Young Jump Magazine, the and Tengen. In the celebrity profile section, we have someone here who definitely does not fall into the category of someone who's vanished from the from the limelight. In that, we have a profile of Jay Leno. At the time the issue came out, Leno was actually a rising star. He had not achieved his well current level of fame. He was the substitute host for The Tonight Show for when Johnny Carson was taking time off. This was kind of leading into Leno being transitioned into his current position as the main host of the show. Uh, apparently, Leno plays a bunch of NES games, and he's beaten the first and second quest of Zelda, and generally prefers RPGs to shoot 'em ups So this makes me wonder, is Leno still playing video games? If so... What is he playing? Is he playing like RPGs like Etrian Odyssey, which might work better with his schedule or that sort of thing, as opposed to, say, WoW or other MMOs where they're a bit more time intensive and wouldn't work as well for somebody who, you know, has a full time job as an entertainer. Kind of two full time jobs because it's Tonight Show and he also does, still does stand up gigs. Um, it'd be interesting to know. Oh, what the hell. Jay, if you're watching this, Please post a YouTube response answering my question. That's probably never going to happen, but I'm going to try it anyway, because what's it going to hurt? In the mailbox column, we get an explanation about who created Super Mario Brothers and why they named the character Mario, as well as the official explanation of that the character was named after Nintendo of America's then landlord. From there, we get our top 30 column, where the rankings have shaken up once again, big time. Metal Gear has entered the rankings and reached number three with a bullet. My pick for this week is Blades of Steel. It's even available on Wii's Virtual Console, and as it's great in single player and two player, we have the rare, well, pick that fits for both categories. And for that matter, at long last, I have found the console hockey game which I have been waiting for and searching for for all these many long years. What? 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 Why are you laughing? You! Stop laughing! Alright, fine. I'll tell you what. Next time, we'll see how much you laugh when we get to the next installment of the Nintendo Power Retrospective, and I'll see you then.